and welcome to the GFI Business of Alt Protein Monthly Seminar. My name is Audrey Gear, and I'm a Startup Innovation Specialist at the Good Food Institute. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Good Food Institute is an international nonprofit organization that is developing the roadmap for sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. We identify the most effective solutions, mobilize resources and talent, and empower partners across the food system to make alternative proteins accessible, affordable, and most importantly, delicious. Please visit gfi.org to learn more about our work. Uh, before we begin, we just do have a few housekeeping items. First of all, this seminar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel. A copy of the recording will also be emailed to all of everyone who registered after the presentation, and you can view our previous seminars on our YouTube channel. Uh, second of all, this seminar will include an audience Q&A for the last 20 or so minutes. Uh, we ask that you just at, please ask your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat. Uh, you're welcome to ask your questions throughout the seminar, but we'll likely only be able to address them towards the end. And third, immediately following the seminar, we'll be hosting a virtual networking session via the MeetAway platform. Uh, we'll drop the link in the chat that will take you to the registration page where you can sign up if you, if you haven't already done so. And this is just a really great way to meet other professionals in the alt protein industry. You'll be matched with folks from one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I know that I've met some really fantastic people at these mixers. So I encourage all of you to join us after the seminar. Just remember you do need to sign up in RSVP via that meetaway link. And we'll start that right at the top of the hour once the seminar ends. Uh, and finally, we'd love your feedback on the GF Ideas community and these seminars. If you have a few minutes to fill out a feedback form that we'll also drop in the chat, we'd really, really appreciate it. Uh, so with that, let's dive into today's seminar about consumer perceptions of plant-based proteins. Our experts joining us today are Che Green and David Benziquin, who are co-founders of the Moonshot Collaborative. Che Green is a 25-year market research veteran focused on sustainable and ethical consumerism, including plant-based foods. He has led research efforts for groups ranging from Fortune 500 companies to international nonprofits. His work has involved understanding consumers' behavioral motivations and decision-making and applying these insights to help companies expand their customer base and increase sales. His deep consumer research experience includes a range of quantitative, qualitative, and mixed method of research. David Benziquin is one of the world's leading experts in the plant-based food industry. Among his experiences, he spent nearly a decade leading a corporate strategy consulting firm for plant-based consumer products. He founded one of the first plant-based seafood companies and has invested in a number of businesses in the space. In addition to his work at Moonshot Collaborative, he is the founder of Mission Plant and co-founder of the e-commerce site plantbelly.com. Che and David, welcome. We're so lucky to have you here today. I know you have a great presentation prepared for us with the latest research on consumer perceptions of alt proteins. So I will hand it over to you to take it from here. Thank you so much for having us. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with the presentation we have here. Can everybody see this? Fantastic. Okay, so over the last year and a few months, Che and I have been working on uh, collecting a lot of fascinating data, and we were hoping that sharing some of it today would be exciting for you. As a little background, uh, Moonshot Collaborative is the first uh, in the world consumer research firm focused entirely on understanding the universe of shoppers who are interested in plant-based alternative protein and sustainability areas. And we help companies in this space with uh, designing their research and deciding how and what to ask um, developing a community to, uh, to survey. We have our own community that you can use. We can also help you survey your own or others. Leading focus groups and interviews with consumers, analyzing existing data you may have, and also even with in-home product testing. This research can be used for things like validating new product ideas as concept tests, checking what people think of different packaging or messaging ideas, doing price sensitivity research or within home product testing, even sending product to people's homes and getting their feedback on the actual products and how they use them. So it's really exciting and gives a good opportunity to uh, reach consumers and get those insights. 
I want to quickly share some information about the Better Buying Panel. The Better Buying Panel is our community of thousands of shoppers here in the U.S., all of whom have purchased plant-based alternatives to meat, dairy, or eggs in the 90 days prior to signing up for our panel. And so this is an audience that is uh, largely flexitarian or reducetarian in their nature. They're people who eat plant-based products at least occasionally. We have intentionally capped the number of vegetarians and vegans at below 10% so that while we do include that audience, we also get a lot of insights from people who, whom we're trying to sway, right? With uh, about 1% of the country being vegan and somewhere between five and 6% being vegetarian, we know that the biggest opportunity financially and in terms of mission impact is to get non-vegetarians to eat these products. And so that's why we target that broader population. And it's a great audience, not only to test things for alternative protein and plant-based, but also other areas of sustainability and wellness issues, as there's a lot of crossover between those that care about plant-based or alternative protein and these other areas. Okay, so, Che and I have looked at a number of different ingredients and manufacturing processes that we know are of interest to our industry, including some that have been seen as controversial or have been implied as controversial. And we needed, wanted to see how much of that is true, how concerned are consumers actually, uh, how aware are consumers actually about these ingredients or processes, and to what extent are we just in a bubble hearing good or bad uh, hype uh, one way or the other about any of these particular ingredients. So here are a smattering of some of the ones we looked at, some different gums, um, some of the core proteins that we use in our products like nuts and seeds and things, peas, wheat, soy, etc., mycelium, um, as well as some, uh, some other ingredients that are commonly used that have had you know, at least some question about how popular they may be, like methyl cellulose or carrageenan or others. So these are some of the ones we looked at. So at a high level, uh, we wanted to understand at the very fundamental level, and we'll get deeper as we go along, when consumers are thinking about buying plant-based foods, what is important to them? What are the key things? And so the first thing we asked about was about how important a short and simple list of ingredients is. And what you find is that when asked that way, when asked is a short and simple list of ingredients uh, that are familiar to you important, you know, you do see the vast majority of consumers say yes, right? Whether moderately, very, or extremely important, you're talking about 80 plus percent of the population at least saying that it's important. This doesn't necessarily reflect how they think about any particular ingredients. Um, I do want to emphasize we're aware that a short list of ingredients and a clean label do not necessarily mean the same thing, but it's important to understand that what we're doing is we're not judging what is right or wrong, we're just providing insights into what consumers think. Because frankly, we can think that soy is completely healthy and safe and that anybody who says otherwise is silly. That doesn't change the fact that consumers may or may not agree. And that's what we wanna test because that's gonna have a major impact on the success of your products. So overall consumers say they do care about simple and short ingredient lists. And then we asked about sustainability. How, basically trying to understand how important sustainability was in ingredients, assuming all other variables were kept constant. And again, if you say, you know, would you want a more sustainable ingredients list if the taste and price were the same? People say yes, though surprisingly, it's not as much as you'd think. You'd think if I said, would I make, should I make it better and keep everything else the same? Of course, everybody would say yes, but actually 43 plus percent said, doesn't really matter. And some said they did buy less. Now, there's always an outlier who might be acting silly or something. So you can probably disregard the one in 3% uh, that said they would buy less, but unless they're just really angry. But you can see that still 43% of our audience said that it wouldn't matter to them if it was more sustainable. Okay. So make sure I didn't skip any slides. Sorry, we're good. Okay. So, um, when asked which of the following attributes were top three import of top three importance to consumers when uh, reading labels for plant-based meat, dairy, and egg alternatives, the ones that received the most votes were all natural, plant-based, 
um, not having artificial ingredients, having ingredients they deemed nutritious, and then on and on. Um, you'll see that containing real fruit and vegetables are also on there. We had a lot of options. These are the ones in this order that were the most popular uh, among when people had the option to choose up to three attributes that were of particular importance to them. And we decided to dive in a little further on organic and non-GMO. There's a lot of question about these issues. We know that people are very curious about how uh, consumers respond to these factors. And so we asked, when you buy plant-based alternatives to meat, dairy, or eggs, how important is it that they are organic? Now, remember that when we're asking these questions, we're not always getting data on what consumers are doing at the grocery store. We're getting their perceptions of what matters to them when they're asked in a vacuum. And it's still important, even if it doesn't reflect exact shopping behaviors, because it reflects um, their, uh, the behavior they aspire to act on. And so what I mean by that is, I might only buy organic 5% of the time, but if you ask me, do you think it's important to buy organic? I might say very. Well, that could mean that I wish I was somebody who purchased more organic, but other barriers like price or other things got in the way. And so this might, might reflect that. So when asked how important it is that uh, items are organic, you can see that we had approximately 60% of the population uh, was uh, felt it was at least moderately important. Uh, and then another 40% or so thought it was less important. And on the non-GMO side, the numbers are similar, but they shift slightly higher towards the extremely important side. There has definitely been a significant effort by uh, certain communities to advocate for non-GMO as, as a good alternative to organic. Uh, people can agree or disagree with that, but certainly there has been some probably more effective uh, messaging around the benefits of non-GMO to organic in recent years. Some have argued this is because organic is a government-run program and non-GMO is a third-party-run uh, advocacy movement. And so it can be seen that there may be more effective marketing by the third parties, by the public sector, by the non-public sector. I see we have a question in here. So I was asked, uh, is this con US consumer only? That's a great question. So our audience is consumers within the United States. Um, and so there may be some changes, there may be some differences in other markets. And so for example, if you ask these exact questions in Europe, it wouldn't surprise me if the number of consumers who thought non-GMO and organic was important would be higher. Here, um, these are the numbers for the United States. I'll just jump in real quick on, on that as well, which is just, a, I don't think you said this at the outset, David, when you described the panel, which is that it, it represents about 40 to 45% of the US adults in the, in the United States. So roughly, you know, four in 10 adults match this profile. And again, the framework for all this is people who have purchased plant-based food. So I think it's interesting to see that those numbers aren't actually higher, but the people who are primed consumers in this area, I would have expected those numbers to be a bit higher. I also saw the question come in in terms of sample size. These are questions that were asked over a number of different months of our panel, and so they vary a little bit, but all of them are 650 or more sample size So to answer that question. Thank you, Che. Yes, and, and in the past, I've been asked how representative this is of the U.S. geographically, racially, by age and gender and sex and other things. And so what we can say is that in terms of age, we do start at 18 plus, but beyond that, this is demographically very uh, proportional to the United States population. Um, the only reason that it only represents 40% of the population is because that's the population of the US that are buying plant-based alternatives at least once every 90 days. And that is largely people who may occasionally buy almond milk, but then have cheese at dinner or other things. And so that's a, a large population in the United States that we're, that we're speaking to. We didn't include people who would never buy these products because then they may not be the perfect consumers for us to test. So we looked at some key ingredients that I know people are particularly curious about, uh, carrageenan, methyl cellulose, and guar gum. Uh, the reason we chose these, particularly carrageenan, methyl cellulose, you know, for better or worse, they have had some uh, 
you know, some uh, controversy in the public sphere. I, you know, mostly in uh, within the community of wellness and and food advocates. Um, and you know, it's very debatable about whether you know every ingredient has its detractors and its advocates. One could argue that they're that they're right or wrong, and we're not here to we're not here to speak to that. Um, that's not our purpose to say that these are good or bad ingredients. Um, but they have served a functional purpose in plant-based products historically, in many different plant-based products and animal-based products. And so, um, you know, one thing is I know that many brands have expressed an interest in moving away from some of these ingredients, but have struggled because of a lack of alternative functional ingredients that have served the same purpose. Um, importantly, when you look at uh, carrageenan, despite some negative public sentiment or public expression, uh, more people felt positively about it than negatively about it. Only 12% uh, said that overall their opinion of it was negative and 22 positive. The vast majority said it was neutral. And I think this is a theme that we're gonna find is that what we, what we need to recognize is that most consumers are nowhere near as familiar as we are with these ingredients and the pros or cons or what we hear about them as those of us in the industry are, we're really in a bubble. And so um, it's important to consider that we might live in this world where these things are very good or very bad, but for most consumers, um, that's way too in the weeds for what they look at. Um, I see a new question. Can we presume that neutral means they don't know? Yes. Uh, neutral means they either have no opinion, but it very likely means that they don't know or um, you know, just don't feel confident enough in their knowledge to answer it. Which is an interesting finding in, in its own, right? The, the, it would have been ideal, these were sort of quick hit survey questions, it would have been ideal to ask about familiarity sort of as a separate question. But if we do assume that that sort of mirrors the real world, which is that people would look at ingredient lists, not necessarily know what they mean, but these, these terms and these ingredients aren't bothering the vast majority of consumers, so roughly two thirds of plant-based buyers. Whether or not they know the term, it's not a, a factor for them in terms of their purchase decision. And I see that Sandrine asked, um, or says that she's not sure that in Europe, the answers would be similar. I think you're right. I think there might be some distinct differences in Europe. Uh, our panel is in the US. We're very interested in doing research in other markets. And if that's something you'd like, we'd love to work with you on that. Um, we'd, be, we'd be very interested in doing that. Um, we have another question about how many people were in the survey. And so the, the different surveys varied in size, but they're all statistical significance with a minimum size of, of 600 plus consumers. Um, excuse me, which is uh, an appropriate size to do quantitative research for the United States. Okay. Perfect. Um, we looked at key ingredients that are used across a lot of plant-based products to see how consumers felt about their interest in these products, right? Would you try products? How interested are you trying products made from these? And you can see here, uh, we had a, a wide swath. So in nuts, we have a huge percentage of consumers who are very interested or somewhat interested in trying this. Well over 80% of the population were very or somewhat interested in trying products made from nuts. Um, same again for seeds and around that for lagoons, um, there is a slightly higher percentage of people who said they don't know for lagoons. I would guess that's because they might not know that word. Um, you know, if we said pulses or, you know, there are so many words that can mean the same thing. Beans may or may not be exactly accurate, but, um, you know, sometimes asking questions different ways can really make a difference. And so that might be an example of that, but still we have, you know, at least enough people know that, uh, you know, over 90% of people did answer the question one way or another. And of those, uh, you know, about 80% said they were um, somewhat or very interested in trying products made from legumes. Um, and then seaweed, algae, and mycelium, you see a major drop off in awareness um, and also in interest. Maybe the difference between seaweed and algae is funny because it might reflect a, a lack of knowledge of, of their similarities or of their um, sharing the same kingdom. Um, but that has to do with, you know, negative perceptions of taste. It could have to do with a lot of things. 
Uh, but what we knew, what we know is that for seaweed analogy, there is an awareness and uh, barrier of perception that we have to overcome in educating consumers, either through driving trial of products that they overcome their fears or other things like that. Then when the last one with mycelium, it could be because the word mycelium in and of itself is not well recognized. And maybe there are other ways that um, this could be asked to, to address that. But as long as the uh, mycoprotein industry has not settled on one universal word, whether it's mycoprotein, mycelium, mushroom protein, fungal protein, whatever we use, as long as there's not a universal word for that that we start to associate consumers with, with any of these areas, I think we're gonna have some challenge um, overcoming a lack of consumer knowledge and possibly intimidation because of that, right? The more familiar somebody is with something, the less intimidated they are. But you can see, you know, when you hear of it as mycelium, people are not super excited. So there's a lot of education to do there. And I believe it'd be the same thing if we asked for mycoprotein. We haven't tested that exact word, um, but that's something to look at. Okay. Uh, a couple uh, of, David, may I jump in just a couple on that previous slide, a couple of demographic absolutely. points, which I think are, are interesting. You know, we talk a lot in, in our space about food neophilia and neophobia and people who are sort of gravitating toward new types of food or less familiar types of food. And what we see with these is that that is true of both younger generations as well as men. And so, for instance, we know that millennials are driving a lot of the adoption of plant-based foods, but Gen Z is the most interested in these alternative types of proteins like seaweed, algae, and mycelium. Ditto for gender, where you have women who are 60 to 65% of plant-based buyers, at least in the United States, but men are more open to trying and more interested in trying seaweed, algae, and mycelium. So you get a smaller percentage of the overall plant-based consumer uh, you know, segment, but also much more interest in some of these non-traditional protein sources. Thank you so much, Che. And that's one thing to know about when we're doing research, in addition to having this dedicated panel of consumers, what we've done is we've profiled them very deeply. And so we know a lot about their demographics, who they are, their psychographics, what they believe, and their behavioral attributes, what they do. So who they are, what do they look like, age, gender, whatever, psychographics, what motivates them to make the decisions they do? Are they plant-based for animals? Are they motivated by giving their kids healthy food, whatever it may be? And then behavioral attributes, what stores do they shop at? What products do they frequently purchase? These kinds of questions. And so we have gathered so much data about these consumers, dozens and dozens of different data points about who they are and what they believe. And so when doing this research, we're showing you top line what the mass numbers are of what consumers, you know, as a percentage of our total audience are saying, um, but the data we actually get back is much deeper than this. And so if you do research with us, you'll see that you can find out exactly which consumers are believing what based on those areas. So you can cross it with who you think your audience is. Um, looking at some of the key proteins that we're commonly seeing in products, soy, peas, wheat, and we threw potatoes in there because there's some recent excitement around potatoes as a dairy ingredient or other areas because of its cost. Um, so we find that uh, overall, every one of these ingredients except for wheat has a, you know, more than half the population views them positively overall. Um, despite a lot of negative messaging from groups like the Weston T. Price and whatever else, you know, only 14% of the population right now says that they have a negative view of soy. Um, and about 16% of wheat and 6% of peas. Um, now, these are when asked in the context of what is your opinion of this ingredient, period. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it would carry the same uh, if asked within the context of a particular label. And what I mean of that is that you know, if the label says soy protein isolate, it might be different than just if it says soy, same with peas. Um, and maybe when it's associated with a certain kind of product, it might be different. So if I say peas in general in a casserole, I might be all about it. If I say pea milk, I may or may not be as excited. And so it's important to consider that, that some ingredients have certain taste perception that can impact 
uh, how consumers perceive of it in uh, particular ingredient and application. But the good news for soy and peas and potatoes is that overall, particularly for potatoes, consumers tend to be uh, fond of these ingredients and consider them positively. Um, and you can also see in wheat, uh, there's a lot of, uh, th there's a lot less positivity and some neutrality. And I would probably assume that this is because of the anti-gluten craze um, and anti-carb craze that has hit, uh, you know, the market in over the last 20 years from Atkins to wheat belly and whatever else. Um, regardless of our opinion of that and how scientific it may or may not be. Um, but I think the, the fact that it says that people are neutral, I think that speaks more to the feeling that consumers feel confused. The fact is there's been so much confusion, right? There's people understand there's a difference in certain kinds of wheat and others like processed bread, you know, white bread and whole wheat bread. People understand that there's you know, they don't really know what gluten is, but they think it's associated with wheat, right? When you have a lot of confusing information out there, people tend to get stuck in the middle. And so there's a lot to overcome for gaining the trust of consumers around wheat as an ingredient. Um, potatoes, at least in a general context, have seemed to have a very positive connotation or a positive uh, perception. Uh, Sandrine, you asked, is it the same regarding isolates versus concentrates? So the question here wasn't about isolates or concentrates. It was uh, just for the ingredients as listed here, soy, peas, wheat, or potatoes. And so it could be different if you asked isolate, concentrate, lecithin, or whatever it may be. We asked at the high level first. Um, was the soy disenchantment correlated with children, infants in the household? Very interesting question. Um, I didn't do that cross uh, varied analysis. Shay, do you know? Not off the top of my head. Sorry, I can try to look it up while we're doing this. Cool. Yeah, that's a great question, though. There's certainly, um, you know, there certainly could be some of that around allergenicity or other things like that. Okay. So are you more likely or less likely to buy a food or beverage product if it contains these ingredients? Now, interestingly, we see Quite a, quite a difference here. Um, while people are, you know, favorable, while, while people find potatoes, soy, and peas very favorable and overwhelmingly like the idea of them holistically, when it comes to actually how it affects purchase intent, it tends to be pretty neutral. We don't see a huge, uh, you know, we don't see a huge weight one side or the other, with the exception of potatoes, where very few would, would be less likely to buy it. Um, you know, even with soy, which has the, the, the uh, largest share of people saying they'd be less likely to buy it, it's still only 21% of the population. And so what we're finding is that for most people, it's either good or, or, or meaningless, whether this ingredient is included or not. And that's important. Uh, how much does it cost to carry out such a nice survey? Uh, Samuel, thank you for that question. We'd be happy to chat about that at some point. It really depends on the structure of the research. We do both custom research and uh, off-the-shelf research. We can we can certainly discuss that at a different time, um, or find me in the meet away after this, and we can chat about that. When it comes to plant-based food and beverages, how likely are you to buy products made from these? So the last question was, would you be more or less likely? Um, this time we asked. Um, you know, how likely would you be? It's a slightly way of, a different way of asking the same question. And it found very different results, which speaks to how tweaks in language can really frame something. It's one of the reasons that we so, so, so strongly advise companies to work with a professional researcher, whether it's Che and our team or, or elsewhere uh, in phrasing questions and deciding methodology for research because the simplest word can throw something off and bias a population or, or get you an inaccurate answer. Um, so what you find here is that, you know, um, when asked, would it be more or less likely to buy it based on that ingredient? We found pretty, pretty folks were pretty neutral. Um, but when it comes to how likely they are, overwhelmingly they're saying they're very likely. It may just be because they recognize that these, pro that these ingredients are ubiquitous in the market. And so they're saying, well, I'm gonna buy it whether I like it or not, um, or it may mean that when asked this way, they felt more positively about it. Now, 
um, we asked about the same ingredients and we wanted to understand what they what consumers see as benefits benefits of these. So when it comes to soy, we listed what for each of these we listed a, a, a range of different attributes they could say were the good or bad things about these ingredients. We first said, which of these are reasons you'd like it? Which of these are reasons you don't like it? And so um, for soy, um, more than half the population sees it as high in protein. Um, I, interestingly enough, only 15% of the population thinks that soy is inexpensive. Uh, it's funny for those of us in the market who know how cheap soy is compared to other ingredients, but it may just could be that consumers are associating soy with plant-based products that they deem to be more expensive, and that's framing how they see that. Um, only 16% said that they believe that products made with soy taste good. Um, only 21% said they think it's grown sustainably. But 50% said that they believe that soy uh, products, soy-based products are healthy or nutritious. And so the strengths are around protein and nutrition, but there's a weakness in perception around cost, taste, and sustainability. And so when you're thinking about how to frame a product that includes these ingredients, knowing this is, in, is helpful for you to understand what might be the most compelling arguments to reach consumers and also what might be barriers that you have to overcome. You know, if you're using a, you know, a, a soybean that's grown in somebody's backyard without any monocropping or GMOs, and it's only sold within three miles, and you know, you used recycled rainwater to grow it, and you want to convince people that you're that it's sustainable, that might be something that you have to really educate them on because of their initial perceptions. Um, looking at peas, similar, similar reactions here. Um, extremely high reactions to the perception of nutrition and healthfulness. Um, half the population thinks that that's two thirds, half the population thinks it's high in protein. But again, when it came to price, taste and sustainability, we have a much lower favorability there. Um, those were not seen as key benefits. And uh, when you look at wheat, uh, about a quarter of the population felt that it was high in protein, a quarter felt that it was inexpensive, a quarter felt it tastes good, and just under half felt that it was healthy or nutritious. Um, and remember, these aren't, do you think it's healthy and nutritious? Do you think it's expensive? This is, choose which two of these are the top reasons why you, uh, that, you that you associate with these ingredients. So, you know, um, I associate, so if they said that they think wheat is good because it's healthy, nutritious, and inexpensive, that's what their votes would go to. Um, was flavor ability ever discussed or surveyed? I'm not sure what that question exactly means. Um, maybe if you can clarify that, I'd be happy to look at it again, if you can clarify what you're asking about there. Um, and then for potatoes, there's a much lower perception of how high in protein potatoes are. Um, but they are deemed very inexpensive. Again, this might just have to do with how consumers are used to buying potatoes in the produce aisle and how they think of them that way. Um, uh, consumers tend to think that potatoes taste good. And so when they think of ingredient of products made with potatoes, it has a much higher favorability rating than the other ingredients. Um, and then in terms of sustainability and nutrition, it's weak. It's, it's about the same on sustainability and a little weaker than the others on nutrition or health per, perception, maybe because people associate it as a starch that doesn't provide as much value. We don't know. Um, uh, was flavor ever discussed or surveyed? I, I, I don't know exactly. I'm so sorry, Geetha. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking about with, with flavor, because I don't know how you would ask that in a question. Um, if you mean if you mean, did people think of these products as, as, as having good flavor, I think the closest proximity would be for tasting good. Um, and um, I'm, I'm super happy that you're excited about tempeh. I'm excited about tempeh too. I just appreciate it if you'd leave this space for questions so that we can allow others to ask theirs. Thanks so much. Um, what are the drawbacks? So we asked also about the negative associations with these ingredients. 13% uh, of people thought soy was unhealthy. 
23% said that they thought it was too expensive. Again, remember these were the top two things they associated negatively with these ingredients. 28% um, said it didn't taste good. 10% said it was bad for the environment. And 12% said it's in too many products. Um, peas, very few people think it's unhealthy. And so that's really good. We see a, a heavy balance towards perception of health there. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see the rest. But uh, in terms of taste, wheat and potatoes had very few people who thought they didn't taste good. About just under a third of the population thought that soy and pea based products didn't taste good. Um, and then you can see on farming, while while in the first question, sustainability was not ranked that highly for soy and peas and wheat, here you can see that it wasn't chosen as one of the top concerns for consumers as what they associated with these products. Whoops. Okay. Is that it already? Wow. <laughs> I flew through that. Um, thank you so much for, for that. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. I see we have some in the Q&A and, uh, and in the chat. So I'm going to stop the share here. There was one question that I accidentally dismissed, I think, from uh, Cesar. Um, and that was about, do we have a similar graph about large food companies? And the answer is no. So we're mostly consumer focused. We do occasionally do research with the large companies, but that's rare for us. Thank you. Yeah, we are happy to perform research on any audience. Um, so we've had folks come to us with their newsletter email list or their social media audience and ask us to do research on that. And that's certainly something we can do. But the panel that we have in a permanent fashion is uh, the consumers that we described previously. Thank you so much for such a terrific presentation today that had some amazing insights that I, I think will be very, very valuable for the community. Uh, just a reminder, everyone, if you have questions, we have about 20 minutes left today, uh, so please ask them in the Q&A box. Um, David and Tay are experts and would be delighted to answer anything you have for them. Uh, I do see a question here about if this presentation will be made available uh, as a PDF. Uh, we will be making this presentation available following the webinar. It will be posted as a recording on GFI's YouTube channel. Uh, we will also be sharing the presentation itself as either a PowerPoint or a PDF. So you'll be able to access all of this information uh, following today. Thank you so much. Um, I can see here a couple other questions. Hey, Tim, good to see you here. Um, Tim is asking, do we have these same results around consumer sentiment for precision fermentation? So the answer is we have done some research on precision fermentation. We intend to do more. Um, the it's it's not as clear because um, you know we could ask about the overall perception of the process of Synbio and precision fermentation, but the reality is there's so many nuances there. A lot of consumers are not familiar with these processes, um, and so I think you'd have to parse it out a lot, right? How do you feel about the idea of um, a product being made that is you know, I don't know how I'd ask it, but you know, that is bioidentical to the animal form, or you know, there's so many things you could ask. Um, you know, how do you feel about things being made from you know mycelium cultures? You could ask it a lot of different things with liquid and solid state, but we have not gone into depth on that. Um, our audience is a perfect one to test that with, uh, and we are constantly expanding the research we do around all alternative protein topics, including cellular agriculture and fermentation. In uh, November of last year, we did ask a question about fermentation. It was just whether you would choose a fermented product versus a non-fermented product. And we found a similar sort of reaction, which is that four in 10 consumers said that it doesn't matter to them. Fermentation just doesn't make a difference. And then the rest are split pretty much evenly between choosing the fermented product versus choosing the non-fermented product. And I think one thing that, you know, that may work in our community's favor or, or not, you know, is, is that uh, fermentation is a process that is known in a very different context around uh, yogurt cultures and cheese cultures, around sauerkraut and kombucha and kimchi. And so uh, that association may cut in our favor sometimes because I think people tend to think of fermented foods in that context as quite healthy and quite good for the gut. 
Uh, on the other hand, they may have negative perceptions of them from a, a taste perspective. Some people think of fermentation as meaning rotten or other things. And so that could cut both ways. Um, certainly people have strong opinions about the flavors or aromas that come from you know, those kinds of foods. Um, do we have information on perceptions of isolates, of isolates, whether soy or pea? I can't remember if we've done research specifically on that. I don't believe so. Not isolates versus concentrates. It's um, it's somewhat inside baseball, I think, for the industry and it's lost on consumers. So we'd really have to it'd almost be more qualitative research where you educate the consumer on the difference and then get their opinion. Do you have the capacity to do consumer research in other mar in markets other than the U.S.? If not, would you be able to collaborate with a local consulting firm to design the research? Yes and yes. Um, we absolutely can do research anywhere in the world. Uh, the only caveat I'll say is that we would need to acquire or develop the audience with whom we researched. So if you have a company overseas and you wanna research on your own consumer base uh, and you have their email addresses, that's no problem. Uh, we have to understand that that's going to come with a certain bias, right? The people who have purchasely signed up for your newsletter are gonna be people who are already uh, you know, favorable. But if you're trying to test what worked for them or didn't work for them when they tried your product in the past, that might be the perfect audience, particularly to do qualitative research. Um, if you're looking to research the general population or a broader population that you don't already have contact information for and that you don't have the right to be surveying, we can recruit that population for you, but that comes with time and cost, right? So it's perfectly possible for us. That's what we did here. We recruited and built a panel of consumers. Um, there are existing populations that other research firms can lend us um, that we could uh, rent, so to speak. Um, but if we wanted to vet them more, uh, profile them more deeply, if we wanted to understand certain attributes about them beyond what a general firm would give us, then we'd be qualifying them further. Um, but absolutely, we can perform research on any population you'd like. What do you know about the products consumers are enjoying the most right now? Burgers, sausages, or other, and what are they looking for to be created? Great question. Um, so we actually did a, we actually had a question. I don't have it right in front of me. Uh, maybe Jay does. Um, we did a question about what products people were most excited about trying. And if I remember correctly, we published it on our, on our LinkedIn. And if I remember correctly, the products that people were most keen to try alternatives to were those that uh, consumers seemed to perceive as least healthy. And so things like bacon and fried eggs, the more, you know, rich and fatty and salty and overwhelmingly, um, you know, uh, unhealthy the ingredient of the product, the more people seem to be interested in trying a plant-based alternative to it. Now, of course, this could be because they deem that it would be healthier uh, by being of a different form of from plants, um, or it could just mean that they, you know, really crave those foods in any form. Uh, but we did find that that was something people were particularly excited about. Do you see a gender difference in comfort safety of soy products? Great question. Um, Shay, do you have that? Uh... I'm not sure about comfort and safety specifically, but we do see that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, men are more interested in products made from soy and plant-based alternative products made from soy than are women. And so I feel like the, the negative perception of soy is largely concentrated among women, although we would need a little bit more research to, to verify that. But that's the major difference we see gender-wise. It, it does be, that, that is interesting to me. I hadn't heard that, but it does interest me to think that that means that there may not be as much effective uh, penetration of what I believe is a false notion that soy is bad for men's uh, hormonal balance, right? That's been that's been something that has been expressed by often the the meat industry, um, and it does seem like that may not be uh, carrying through as much as hoped. Um, you know, so that's interesting. Do you see a trend in purchasing frequency, habitual adoption of plant based meat alternatives? So we've definitely we definitely study what consumers are doing in terms of how often they buy kind of these kinds of products. And that's part of our understanding these consumers is what do they buy and how often. Um, in terms of specific trends, uh, maybe Che has a better sense of what you're asking. I'm not sure if I am clear on it. 
I, I think you know the premise. Uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, the premise of our panel is is really about that. So it's it's all part time. Uh, plant-based consumers at this point. Like David alluded at the beginning, the vast majority of people in this space, consumers in this space, are having almond milk with their coffee in the morning and then having cow's milk with their cereal the next day. Or they're eating a Beyond Burger when they go out, but they're still eating meat at home. And so what you're seeing is that it's it's very much a, a flexitarian sort of driver behind the market and not, you're seeing increases in the numbers, at least anecdotally, of vegans and vegetarians, but they're still small enough that they're not the major driver of the market. In terms of specific like categories, what we do see is that uh, dairy and burgers are largely the entry points for a lot of people. And then that, then they branch from there. If they do branch, they branch to other product categories from, from those two largely. I hope that partly answers that question. Though that doesn't necessarily represent what people are interested in most or are looking for most in terms of new product introductions that is partially reflective of what's already on the market, what they're familiar with. And you know, certainly when we asked what you would like to see, they were intrigued by the idea of new products. And I mentioned eggs and bacon and other things, right? Those are the kinds of things that got people excited. Um, was seafood understood to be in the meat category? So we have asked all of our panelists about seafood consumption, alternative seafood consumption, um, and certainly they are aware that we are that we are considering uh, alternatives to seafood as part of the group of products that we're asking them about, whether in that particular question when it said meat, dairy, egg alternatives, if they understood seafood to be part of that, I can't speak to that. Um, but I can tell you from, a, from an overall uh, impact, it's quite minimal because the number of consumers who have had plant-based seafood, seafood is next to nothing. Um, you know, uh, uh, scanner data we've seen from Nielsen, Mintel, and other uh, sales agencies shows that the uh, market for, for plant-based seafood, and of course there is no cellular agriculture or fermentation seafood in the market yet, um, the market for plant-based, or very little on the fermentation side, is a total of about 20 million, maybe $30 million maximum. And so when you consider the size of the population, that means that almost none of it, nobody has had it. And so um, I don't think there's a lot of even awareness of it. We haven't seen a lot of, uh, you know, awareness and experience with plant-based or alternative seafoods yet. Have you done any research on consumer perspectives of cultivated meat? Che, are you answering that? I was going to, but I, it might be easier just to answer it live. Uh, Patrick, I, I encourage you to reach out to me. We have very limited data on it, but we do have a little bit. We also have a blog on our website that talks about cultivated, uh, the terminology behind cultivated slash cell-based slash lab slash in vitro slash et cetera. Um, and so I just, I think our email addresses were on there, but I'll also type it into the answer, uh, Patrick, and feel free to reach out. The, just to chime in on that, GFI has done quite a bit of research on nomenclature for cultivated meat. I um, will pop this in the chat. It's on our Consumer Insights page. Encourage everyone on the call here to check out our Consumer Insights as it has a, a range of resources uh, from, from the plant-based to the cultivated meat side of things. Thank you, Audrey. And I'll just also throw in there that, um, of course, when you look at nomenclature, the consumer perception and preference is only one part of that uh, calculation about what you should use, because of course there are legal implications. So when you're looking at those kinds of questions, I would recommend engaging in legal uh, advice around what uh, language to use. Um, the, in the US, it appears thus far that the FDA is the body that has become responsible for regulating uh, nomenclature around cell ag and fermentation. We hope it stays that way because they tend to be more favorable to or less favorable to animal interests, uh, animal food interests. And so that would be great for us. Um, and they don't seem to be looking to cause too many problems. But I think if you were to go ahead and say, you know, you know, amazing and, you know, amazing protein, they might in your ingredient list, they're going to say, Hey, that's not, that's not a thing. Um, so, you know, make sure that you check that with legal. Uh, you said before that Gen Z is the most open towards alternatives. Can you elaborate on that? Did you do segmentation in terms of class, gender specific age group? Can you point out something interesting regarding this age group that came out of data? So, I'll let Shay answer the question about the elaborating on the population, but I will say for starters, 
we have segmentation for a ton of things about these consumers. Um, you know, like I said, we have dozens and dozens of things we know about each of them. And so we can do multivariate analyses and cross tabs where we look at the answers to a question and every single attribute about those populations and then see how they all come together. So we can look at black women in the Midwest between the ages of 40 and 46 and look at what they think about this question compared to other audiences or whatever you want, right? Um, that's not what we presented today uh, because we have so many of those and because you know this research is, is not all, we're not, we're not looking to, to put out everything at this time. Um, we do perform a lot of research, um, but Che, is there anything else you wanna say about the popula that population and motivation? Uh, just a couple of quick things. One is that, as David mentioned at the outset, our panel starts at age 18, so we don't have the full Gen Z population in there, and that means that those are relatively smaller sample sizes, and we weren't able to sort of segment that particular age group more than that. Um, but well, I'll just sort of reiterate what I said earlier, which is that Gen Z, we know Gen Z generally is quite interested. They're following the trends of the millennials. Um, and so that's sort of the, the broader landscape. When it comes to specific ingredients, like we've talked about here today, there's the over index, if you will. So there's more interest in Gen Z, in the Gen Z audience for those non-traditional protein types. So algae, mycelium, seaweed, etc. When you look at the more traditional protein types, so we soy, uh, and so on, there's not any difference. So they don't over-index relative to other age groups. So I hope that's a, at least a little bit more insight on the Gen Z folks. Thank you. Uh, what are the challenges, Edgars? Uh, what, are the cha let's, what are the challenges you see people need to overcome for a more sustainable and or plant-based future? That is a, a big, big question. Uh, when it comes to consumers, it's clear that uh, consumer perception around taste price and texture are, are certainly major barriers. I'd argue probably the biggest barriers to increase adoption. Uh, and it would appear that as we overcome those by offering additional options uh, and options that more closely solve for those issues, uh, those barriers reduce. Um, the great example is around uh, non-dairy milk. I know people overuse it, but I think it's really important to dive into that case study more deeply. The, the things that have led to major, there have been kind of three stages in the growth of non-dairy milks. People always look at it as like a large issue. They never look at the breakdown. The first jump in non-dairy milk consumption happened in 2008 when Almond Breeze uh, was the first company ever to move their non-dairy milks into the refrigerated section. And while I haven't done research on this, my belief is that that's because it changed the consumer perception around the freshness and quality of the product. Um, I grew up in a European household where occasionally we did have shelf-stable Parmalat milk. And I can tell you, I thought of it as nasty and less quality. And um, it also wasn't as ready to drink. And so that made it less convenient. When you put a product in the fridge, you're making it more convenient. You're making it appear more fresh. Certainly when it comes to dairy, you want something to seem fresh and not processed and less um, fresh. So um, that was one big jump in the market. The second is around the introduction of when you see the biggest uh, launch in new product varieties of different ingredient bases, you see another jump. So in the years where we had like, oh, here are five new kinds of milks that suddenly came out, that gives consumers the excitement of trying new things on novelty and hopefully finding something they like. Um, and it also increases shelf space and uh, you know, awareness of the category overall. And then third jump was um, in the last three years with a mass expansion of private label products. So as retailers started launching more of their own brand milks and thereby substantially reducing prices for consumers, you see more lift. And so I would argue that that, uh, the perception of a product's higher quality, um, the availability of more options that can appeal to consumers of different uh, preferences, and price reduction are really good benchmarks for what we need to achieve in different categories. Cliff, nice to, nice to hear from you. Where do you see the biggest product white space right now based on the industry and consumer demand? Again, a big, big question. Um, consumers are just a part of that. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think one challenge is looking at, at 
looking, I, I think the categories that I'm most interested in are those where we see a very large delta between success of the animal product and a success of the plant-based equivalent. And so when you look at categories like plant-based seafood versus the overall seafood category, eggs versus conventional eggs, um, I'm a big, I'm a big, you know, big proponent of solving for the deli meat crisis. Um, I've talked to people about the fact that, you know, we eat six times more cold cut sandwiches in the United States with like sliced meats than burgers. And yet the category for burgers is a billion dollars in alternatives. And the category for plant-based deli slices is just over $40 million. So when you think about a big opportunity, I would say if somebody can solve for that, that's a big one. So anytime there's a big you know, a big uh, delta between the animal and the plant. I think that's the place where I would identify as most promising. I think I we just have time for probably one more question before we wrap it up for today. Okay. Uh, how do I choose one? Who wants to choose one? There's some fantastic questions here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was the basis for choosing the ingredients we chose? Uh, in terms of what we chose, we chose them based on, based on what we have seen as either very frequently used in products or uh, as having any sense of controversy or questionability about, you know, hearing in, the, in our bubble that people think they're particular things. You know, we hear a lot of consumer, a lot of companies responding to a small group of consumers saying, oh, I don't like carrageen or I don't like methyl cellulose or whatever. So we thought that that was valuable information to say, do people actually feel that way in a large number or not? Um, so that's how we- We are gonna be packaging these, these results into a report eventually. So if there are other ingredients that we didn't cover that you think are particularly important, feel free to reach out and we might be able to add those. And every so often you'll see, if you follow us on LinkedIn, we very often ask, often ask for input from our followers for what questions you'd like to see asked. Uh, and then we share those results because we're constantly looking to use this. We hope that the data we're gathering is valuable for the whole industry. We also, of course, can do proprietary research for companies one-on-one, -on -one, um, but we're, you know, we're looking to, to, while paying our bills doing that, we're also looking to balance it with providing as much value as we can to move our whole industry forward. Well, thank you so much, Che and David, for sharing your time and all of your amazing expertise with us today. Uh, as a reminder, everyone, please be on the lookout for the post-webinar email. We'll have the recording of this. We'll have the slides. We'll have some additional resources to share. And make sure to check out gfi.org slash events to stay up to date on all of GFI events and other industry events of interest. Uh, as a reminder, we'd love your feedback on the GF Ideas community and these seminars. So if you could just take a few minutes to share your thoughts uh, in the form we're sharing in the chat, it would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Uh, and as one last reminder, we're now heading over to Meetaway for the virtual networking mixer. Uh, so I hope to see you there and thanks so much for attending today. Bye everyone. Thank you so much.